Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Um, I'm Annie Kokobopa. I'm Associate Professor and uh, Chair of Slavic and Eurasian here at KU and also um, Interim Director of our Cree Center just for the fall. Um, I'm really happy to see everyone here. Uh, we've got about over 40 people and I'm really excited to see so much interest in the topic. Um, for those of you who were with us last time, I talked a bit about how, you know, part of why we're doing this lecture series, which we hope will continue into next semester and, and in the future is because we really want to center this topic, the subject of race. Um, this is a conversation that, you know, we haven't had as much in the field. And if we've had it, it's been sort of a more of a specialized interest. And, you know, for us, for the department, for the center, it's been really important to have this as our kind of core lecture series and make the subject, make this particular intellectual discussion a, a center of our um, intellectual activity for the semester. Um, and I'm really pleased to have here with us today, Kimberly San Julian Varnon, um, who will be giving a talk. Um, and I will introduce Kimberly in one second. No. Have it. Um, and Kimberly is right now a first year doctoral student uh, in the history department at the University of Pennsylvania. Her academic work examines intersections of Black experience, identity, ethnicity, race, and Soviet nationality policy in the Soviet Union and in the post-Soviet space. Some of you may have read her writings already. Um, her public writing also um, has been pretty significant and, and there's been quite a bit of it, I think, in recent months. And it, it analyzes the linkages of race, foreign policy, and culture in the United States, Russia, and Ukraine. And she's also um, a former secondary history teacher and community college educator, um, which I give serious props to after my brief experience with homeschooling the last few months. Um, um, and then today, um, the, the title of Kimberly's talk is, um, excuse me, Russia and Blackness, African American and African Experience in Soviet and Post-Soviet Russia. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Kimberly. She will do her talk for about, you know, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll do Q&A after. So if you could save your questions for after, uh, put them in the chat. You could put them in the chat as they come up, but um, we'll do Q&A after the talk. So Kimberly, thank you. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you everyone for sharing some more time on Zoom after a long day with me. Um, so uh, I am a Soviet and Russian and post-Soviet historian. And I want to tell you a little, about, a little bit about me because my background fundamentally shapes my research. Um, so I'm from Southeast rural Texas, you can tell from the accent. And uh, I started doing Soviet history when I was an undergrad at Swarthmore. And I was just fascinated by the Soviet Union. And I continued on to get my master's degree at Harvard and the RIC program. Um, and it was during my first year of my, of my master's degree, I went to Ukraine for the first time to do um, thesis research. And, and while I was there, I ran into an Afro-Ukrainian girl and we were crossing the street and we just hugged each other. We'd never seen each other, but we just immediately felt this connection. And I remember asking her, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm Ukrainian, like this is my home. And, and so when I got back to Harvard the next fall, I wanted to explore and see, were there people like me and people like her in the Soviet Union? Or were there more people like us in Russia and in Ukraine? And that's what I found. Uh, so my research now for my dissertation comes from this initial experience I had my first year of my grad school. So that's kind of a little bit about me and how I got into this, uh, this you know, piece of my research. Um, so the way I'm going to approach it, I'm going to try to be as chronological as possible. So we're going to look a little bit at Soviet anti-racism in the 20s and 30s. We're going to look at African Americans who go to the Soviet Union before World War II. Then we'll switch gears and move to the post-Stalin period and talk about the African presence in the Soviet Union. And then we'll get to modern day Russia and Ukraine, because I know the talk focuses on Russia, but 
Russia and Ukraine and in terms of the Black experience are very similar and they share a lot of um, similar themes. So I'd like to talk about them. So from the PowerPoint, you'll see this picture. It's from the 1957 youth, um, like the youth fair. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but you will see how multicultural this picture is. And so if you are a person who is from America or from Western Europe, you are very interested in this picture because there's so many colors of people. And so this is something that the Soviets were very aware of, um, was American racism in the 20s and 30s. So we have the Jim Crow laws, especially in the South, but also you have segregation and racism in the North, in which it was very hard to be an African American in the United States. You had, you were denied access to equal education, equal health care, equal jobs, you had very few opportunities. And so the Soviets were aware of this. And they use American racism in their propaganda to, you know, to talk about how terrible America was because of its racism. You see the Soviets using the Scott Squirrel trial in which eight young men were accused of raping a woman and were uh, you know, gonna be put to death. The Soviets very much got involved in that and tried to make it a more international, um, like an international project to free these young men from you know, the lynching essentially in the United States. Um, and as I get into the African-American presence in the Soviet Union, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And so we see the Soviet Union grappling with American racism. And we also have the issue of the Soviets doing this mass project of industrialization. So you kind of have this convergence of these two different layers of historical processes happening at the same time. So moving into the Black presence, the African-American presence in the Soviet Union, we really start seeing African-Americans go to the Soviet Union in the late 1920s, early 1930s. Um, some of them are recruited by Soviet specialists. One of the men I'll talk about later, Robert Robinson, he is recruited because he is a mechanic at the Ford um, plant in Detroit, and he is incredibly skilled at his work, and they recruit him as a specialist. You also have agricultural specialists from the Tuskegee Institute who are recruited to go to the Soviet Union to help them deal with agriculture in Central Asia. And so you see these types of people who see economic opportunity in the Soviet Union that is denied to them in the United States going to the Soviet Union, but also the Soviet Union draws black writers and artists. And so in this picture, you know, black artists in reach the Soviet Union, this group is one of my favorite groups of people. Um, and I, I found this picture while I was doing my initial research in 2014 of this group of people who are going to go shoot a film called Black and White. And the idea behind this film was it was gonna be a, a Soviet film that analyzes American racism. And it was written by people who had never been to America and the director was German and didn't speak Russian. So you have this kind of collective amount of chaos going on with this film. But the black artists who go over to the Soviet Union to participate in this film, and not all of them are actors. Some of them are just, you know, people who wanted to go, um, including Lloyd Patterson, who I don't know if you can see my, uh, cursor, Lloyd Patterson is over here. Um, they go and they kind of explore what does it mean to be Black in the Soviet Union? And when the Soviet Union is trying to be a anti-racist country. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of these men and women. I'm um, starting with Langston Hughes, who's probably the most famous, along with Claude McKay, of the Black writers who go to the Soviet Union. And so Langston, he has this amazing way of, of writing about his travels. And he wrote a book called um, I Wonder As I Wander. And so some of his essays about the Soviet Union are in that book. But I first found out about his book, um, A Negro Looks at Soviet Central Asia. That's the first time I came in contact with Langston Hughes in the Soviet Union. It's this tiny book I found in, you know, deep in the recesses of Lamont Library at Harvard. And if you do have a copy of this book, that would be great if you could like, I don't know, send it to me because it's very expensive and very rare. <laughs> but this book chronicles what he was doing in Central Asia. And my research initially looked at how being in the Soviet Union shaped Black identity. 
And so this group is, they're in Moscow and they're going to hotels and they're kind of experiencing the Soviet Union, but they don't have free reign in the Soviet Union. They can't go everywhere they want. They still are foreign visitors and they're very visually foreign visitors. So they can't, you know, really sneak out and go to places that they want. And so he talks about how blackness, how his idea of blackness is very different once he's removed from the United States. And he understands that his lived experience as a black man in the United States is different in the Soviet Union because of his race. Race very much informed how he was treated in the United States. In Sigilation, he talks about being able to travel in any train car. He didn't have to worry about, you know, if a white person got on the train moving to the back of the train. Although Langston, doesn't, he doesn't have to deal with that as much because he wasn't living in the Jim Crow South, but he's still very much aware of that. He has experienced that. He could share a meal with anyone. He talked about being able to eat meals with anyone of any color. And he noticed that he could live without fear. His actions were not shaped by racial violence and the fear of racial violence. Um, and he says, now I'm riding south from Moscow and I'm not Jim Crow. And none of the darker people on the train with me are Jim Crow. So I make a happy mental note in the back of my mind to write home to the Negro papers. There's no Jim Crow on the trains of the Soviet Union. And it's this little quote, and some people take it very cynically that he's just trying to drum up, you know, how great the Soviet Union is. And a, a lot of white readers of, of Langston kind of do see that. But the ability to travel in space without fear is very new to a lot of these African-American visitors. And he talks about what his life meant and for the first time where he's not constantly conscious of his color. And I don't think that means for Langston that he doesn't see himself as black, but he's able to kind of just imagine what it means to be a human being. And being a human being meaning to have equality in a way. Um, and although not everyone agrees with Langston's ideas on the Soviet Union and how the Soviets treated Black people. Not everyone agrees with him on that experience. Um, another person that I want to talk about, she is, I found her in the archives in a very small book that is very rare, and she is named Margaret Glasgow. She was a hairdresser in New York, and she couldn't get clients because she had white customers and they preferred to have white hairdressers. So she wasn't really getting much work. And her son moved to Moscow and he kind of disappeared. Um, you know, she sent him off to college and he ended up <laughs> showing up in Moscow and he wrote to her and he said, life here is boiling like water in a kettle. There's so much work the workers can't do it all. Here, no one even notices my black skin. Only now and then children will stop and say, oh look, there's a black man but they cry out, not in spite, but only in surprise. And so Margaret is thinking to herself, well, I can't get work here. My son's in Moscow, he says it's safe, he says there's opportunity. So she picks up and moves, she goes to Russia. And so when she gets to Russia, she, when she goes to the Soviet Union, she gets to the, you know, the Russian Soviet state. And she said, by the force of habit, I expected that the white people here as everywhere else, would treat me with hostility. But to my joy, I found just the opposite. Comrade, that was the first word I heard. I felt at home among my own folks in my own country. And so I think what Margaret's experience, the anticipation of hostility from whites, very much shows us how important it is to understand the impact of violence both emotional violence and physical violence in, in the Black experience, the lived Black experience in the United States, and how that shaped their understandings of what treatment would be like in the Soviet Union. And she is very happily wrong about this. And not only does Margaret, you know, move to the Soviet Union and become a worker, she gets to create a new identity. And so she changed her profession. She quit being a hairdresser and she became a factory worker. And not only did she become a factory worker, she became a new darnik, right? Like a stakhanovite. She was the top of the top of workers, the most productive. And she talks about this. She says, now I'm living in a worker house with Englishmen and Germans 
and I've quite forgotten that I'm Black. I simply feel like a human being, that's all. I've been given a special shock brigaders card for the dining room. And so I, when she talks about forgetting that she's Black, I don't think she literally thought she was not Black. I, I think what she's talking about is she was able to gain this new Soviet identity of a new daughter, a shock worker, which in the Soviet Union meant opportunities. It meant privileges. She got a special dining room card. She got better food. She got better housing. She got better educational opportunities. And these were things that were denied to her while she was in the United States. And so when we read sources, and it's a very small letter that I randomly found in a small book. Um, and that's kind of the issue when you work on African-Americans in the Soviet Union, what is available, there isn't a lot available. So you kind of have to pull as much as you can from the sources. But her experience is fascinating because Margaret Glasgow will end up, like her family will end up becoming a very important part of Soviet movie history. So remind me to get back to that because I will talk about Miss Glasgow again. Um, so I want to go back and show you this picture of Langston. So he, he's in Turkestan and something that Langston notices is something that just shocked me when I first saw these pictures. He notices that he isn't the darkest person in the pictures. When he goes to Central Asia, he notes that he is not the darkest skinned person. And he talks about how strange it is to go to Turkestan and see people picking cotton. But the atmosphere of them picking cotton is very different. He doesn't see that they're not sharecroppers. They aren't like what he saw in the South. These are people who are picking cotton, but you're picking cotton to build socialism. They have this greater you know, meaning to it. Um, so it's really interesting to kind of look at the different skin hues, but also different types of identity. Langston talks about this, but also um, another African-American visitor talks about how when he got to Uzbekistan to help them with, you know, agriculture, that people would come up to him and speak Uzbek to him. And he was just shocked. He's like, they would talk Uzbek to me. They thought I was Uzbek. And it's one of the first times where someone wants him to be like them. They want him to be of that nationality or of that identity. Because in the United States, he could never pass as white. His name is George Times. He can never pass as white. But when he goes to Uzbekistan, they think he's Uzbek. And they share with him. And he ends up staying and dying in Uzbekistan. I think he died in the 40s. Um, so you, you have these experiences like that. But not everyone loved the Soviet Union while they were there. Not everyone had the most amazing experience. Um, Robert Robinson is one of the most interesting Black visitors to the Soviet Union because he was attacked when he was in the Soviet Union and he became um, kind of like a Soviet star, not necessarily good, just kind of infamous for what happened to him. So he was working at the Ford plant, the Ford Motor Plant, he's the only Black worker there. Um, and other white workers tried to mess with his um, tools. They tried to electrocute him. And so Soviet representatives came and they were recruiting workers. And so he was recruited with a handful of white workers. Um, and so while he is going over, there are you know, white workers who refuse to eat with him on the ship. And there are people who refuse to share a room with him on the ship. And he's fascinated because the, um, the Soviet I guess guard who was, you know, making sure everyone everyone was on the right ship and everyone had the right rooms. He said, comrade, you know, I don't understand why you don't want to share a room with this man. And the white worker's like, he's black, like I'm not gonna do it. And the co and the guard goes, Well, comrade, in the Soviet Union, we don't have racism. So you have to share your room with him or you know, you have to get off the boat. And so like Robert's just really like self satisfied, like, yes, you know, this is finally <laughs> someone stands up, you know, to these white racists who've been terrorizing him at work. And so in the Soviet Union, he is able to work. He's very productive. He gets, you know, a skilled level jobs that he wasn't able to get in America, but he did not feel he could forget his skin color. And unlike Langston, he never feels or says, I'm not black. He is constantly aware of his racial difference. Um, he noticed that when they would go to dances, Soviet men would like encourage their girlfriends to go dance with him. 
And his initial reaction was to just refuse. Because in the South or in Detroit, where he was working, if he danced with a white woman, he could be killed. And so he learned and he writes about having to unteach himself these behaviors that kept him safe in the United States, but then made him socially awkward in the Soviet Union. And he says it's very curious. He said Soviet anti-racism is very curious as you get more aware of your race. Um, but something that makes him famous is two American workers, two white American workers attacked him in 1930. Um, they had been antagonizing him for weeks, spitting at him, you know, doing the things they would have gotten away with in the United States. And eventually it was big news that he had been attacked. The two men who had attacked him, um, they were convicted of assault and they were deported from the Soviet Union. And Robinson kind of became this local celebrity, but he was uncomfortable. And he knew, he kind of felt like he was being used, like his story was being used by the Soviet Union to promote itself, you know, as we will not have racism here. And he has this, it's pretty like much like an Odysseus kind of experience. He stays in the Soviet Union for a while. He doesn't feel comfortable because at times he feels like he's performing blackness, um, you know, putting, having to put on a show for Soviet consumption. And he ends up staying in the Soviet Union. He leaves after World War II. He gains Soviet citizenship. And then he tries to come back to America. And he's not allowed into the United States again until 1986. So he has this, you know, 50-year odyssey with the Soviets. And he ends back, he back, ends up in the, in the United States again, and he writes his book. And when you're reading his autobiography, you do have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. And that's because of something we've seen with Robert Robinson, but also Langston Hughes, Paul Robeson. There is a very heavy social and professional toll and weight that happens when you have gone to the Soviet Union and you come back. Either you disavow the positive things you said about the Soviet Union or you're blacklisted in the United States, you know, particularly in McCarthyism. And so when we're reading these works, you know, later on, and they're talking about the Soviet Union, we kind of do have to remind ourselves of what was the, you know, the issue of them praising the Soviets. Um, so one more guy, his name is Lovett Fort Whiteman. I learned about him thanks to Sean Guillory at University of Pittsburgh. He was a Black communist, and he was hanging out in Moscow with a lot of these Black actors who came to the Black and White film. He was kind of like the resident um, like black community leader in, in Moscow. Although there wasn't like an official community, but when black people would arrive in Moscow, he would sometimes be there and greeting them and kind of showing them around. Um, and what makes him special is he is, as far as we know, as far as the data shows, he's the only African-American victim of the terror. Um, so the terror that happened in 1937, the Soviet Union, he was arrested, he was beaten, he, he ends up dying in a, in a work camp. Um, but what is interesting is that Love at Fort Whiteman was very, he was kind of very critical of Soviet anti-racism. And he didn't like that you couldn't talk about race. He was race conscious and he wanted to build race consciousness amongst you know, the Black residents of the Soviet Union. And so that was kind of seen as being, a, you know, causing a political issue. If the official word is there is no race in the Soviet Union and you're promoting race consciousness, you are going to be labeled a political enemy, which is what happened to him. And so he ends up, he dies in the Soviet Union. Um, and so Sean made a, a short documentary about him you can find on YouTube that's really interesting about this, you know, the sole Black victim of, of the Red Terror in 1937. So I've talked about the Black ag agricultural specialists in Central Asia. Um, and you also have three men who were in the Soviet Union who did not leave and go back to the United States. So Lloyd Patterson, um, who was Margaret Glasgow's son, our hairdresser, her son, Lloyd Patterson was the one who wrote her that letter and told her to come to Moscow. He stayed. Homer Smith, a black journalist, he stayed behind after the initial group left. And Waylon Rudd. And Waylon Rudd and Lloyd Patterson were actually, they became actors. They acted in Soviet um, films. And some of the films, you see them portraying the stereotypical depictions of slaves, of African-Americans. Um, Lloyd Patterson was in Tom Sawyer. He played a slave in the Tom Sawyer, uh, the Soviet version of Tom Sawyer. But what's so interesting about 
Lloyd Patterson is, he stays in the Soviet Union and he marries a Soviet citizen and they have a little baby whose name is George, is, is James Lloydovich Patterson. And so that little baby is James Lloydovich Patterson in the famous movie Cir- Circus. So James Lloydovich Patterson is Margaret Glasgow's grandson. And he's this mixed race baby that they all pass around and kiss, you know, at the end of circus. Um, and he is a representative, a representative of this thing that we see of Afro-Russians, of people who are mixed race, who are black and who are Russian, um, who are born, born in Russia, they speak Russian, and they have an interesting role in, in Russia in the present day. Before I jump ahead too much, um, I do want to go to the 1950s and 60s when we get to the African student presence in the Soviet Union. Um, going back, so you'll see some of the Soviet anti-racist propaganda. Um, so you see a lot of these, and there, some of them are very, um, they're very hard to look at, especially in the 30s. You see a lot of pictures of lynching um, in, in the Soviet propaganda. And in the 1960s, you start seeing more representations of American violence towards, towards Black people. Um, but like under capitalism, you have, you know, a person who's tied up, it looks like he's being burned. And then under socialism, everyone's happy. Right. And so these are the the kind of images that the Soviet Union is projecting itself as anti-racist. But after World War Two, really at, in the late 1930s, when the Soviets end up trying to get recognition by the United States, which is one of the reasons we think the black and white film was never made was because it would have been in a huge affront to the Americans. But also, as we get into World War Two and the Soviet Union is allied with the United States, racism is not a focus. And so after Stalin dies in 53, we have Khrushchev coming to power. And Khrushchev has this great idea. And in 1957, he has the Soviet Youth Festival. And you have students from Africa, students from Asia, people from all around the world who come to the Soviet Union to kind of explore the Soviet Union and to share in Soviet culture. And so this context is really the Soviets focusing on decolonization and being anti-colonial. So this is in the Cold War, right? So we see the United States and the Soviet Union kind of fighting for spheres of influence. And this is definitely connected to that. And so in the Soviet Youth Festival, this is really the first time you see an influx of students from Africa. So you have like a few hundred by the late 1950s, but in the 1960s, it grows to a few thousand. Um, but there is a very big difference between the experience of African students in the 1960s and the experience of African Americans in the 20s and 30s. So in February 1960, we have the establishment of Friendship uh, University or the Lumumba University, which is where most African students go. In the 1920s, you did have some African students go to the university for the Toilers of the East, including Jomo Kenyatta, so one of the you know, anti-colonial leaders from Kenya. He was actually a student in, in I think, 1932. He went to the, toilet, the University of the Toilers of the East, and he actually did not like his time in the Soviet Union while he was in university, and he complained about Soviet depictions of Black people, of them being racist, and of them being like minstrel shows. And if you look at some of the, the films that Lloyd Patterson and Wayland Rudd were in, they it, it is very much a remnant of you know these kind of menstrual shows but he also hated the food there are just like reports of him talking about how terrible russian food was in the 1930s um so it's just one of these weird things but by the 1960s african students who are going to the soviet union um they see this as an educational opportunity they're not really drawn in because of the soviet union being anti-racist but also the the context is different these are people who were coming to the Soviet Union to gain skills to go back home and to lead these newly independent countries. And they're very weary um, of the Soviet claims of anti-racism. They don't really trust them. They aren't leaving Jim, the Jim Crow South. So the bar is higher for them in terms of uh, if they're impressed by the Soviet Union. Um, and unfortunately, the, the experience is very different in terms of there are considerable numbers of incidents between Soviet 
students and African students in the Soviet Union. African students wrote often that they were the victims of racial slurs, of being stared at, of being attacked. Some of them started carrying knives around so they could feel safe in, in, in the big cities. Um, they wrote to university officials about this. They wrote to party officials about their experiences. And then in December 1963, a Ghanaian student was murdered. And this is kind of this watershed moment where we start seeing protests by African students. And there are thousands of them in the Soviet Union by this point. So this picture that I'm showing you is from this protest. And so in 1964 and 1965, we have protests, but also constant reports of racist attacks on African students. And while I was doing research for this, I was reading um, in the Moscow Times, there was a, a vignette by a woman named Irina Filatova, who was talking about being a student in the 60s as she was riding the metro, and she was sitting next to her Senegalese um, classmate and his young daughter, and people kept staring at her and no one would sit by them. And when the Senegalese classmate and his daughter got off on their stop and she was by herself, a man came up to her and said, have you no shame? How could you be sitting next to that? And so these kind of experiences belie this, this underlying conflict between being officially anti-racist, but then having racist undertones and interactions with people with dark skin. Um, something that also happens after the 1957 um, youth festival is they, they're called Dieti Festivalia, right? So children of the festival. So mixed race children start being born after the youth festival um, because people get, we, and you see these like news stories about what goes on in the Olympic villages and all these athletes get together. People met different people and people were attracted to different people. And sometimes you have children, right? And so you start having these mixed race children and that carries us into, you know, post-Soviet Russia, where you do have a larger presence of Afro-Russian, but also Afro-Ukrainian people. And something that's interesting is when you read the experiences of some of these people, a lot of them are called either children of the festival or children of the Olympics because of the 1980 Olympics, where you had, you know, more African um, athletes coming in. And it's kind of surprising and also upsetting sometimes when you read how people call a mixed race person, oh, your mom clearly slept with an African athlete and that's why you're here, right? And so this picture, so we have James Lloydovich Patterson, one of our first Afro-Russian children in this movie. He becomes famous because of this film, um, but also he is a Afro-Russian and he is a poet and he's a writer and he acted in films. I think he lives in the United States now. He's still alive. He's 87, 88. Um, and he talks about how in when he was in, I think he was in the Navy, his nickname was Africa. And he talks about this in his poetry, how it bothers him, but he's called Africa and he's never been that, you know, he had he wasn't African, he was Afro-Russian, he was Russian, and how important that identity was to him. And then you see this picture of the African visitors to Moscow during the 1980 Olympics. And so if you look at present day Russia and Ukraine, you do have um, Afro-Russians and Afro-Ukrainians. Most of them actually aren't born because of the 1980 Olympics. They are usually the products of African students who come to Russia or Ukraine who studied and have children with women here, which also leads to these discussions of racism and how these Black visitors are viewed. Um, so I've talked about James Lloydovich Patterson. Another in terms of some of our most famous Afro-Russian, Pushkin, of course, um, is the grandfather of modern Russian language and his great-grandfather, Ganabal, was an African servant. And so what's interesting, if you read the work of James Lloydovich Patterson, he very much identifies with Pushkin. And then he's an, an Afro-Russian poet and he has hair kind of like Pushkin. So what he's able to do is he's kind of struggling with this black identity that he can't really do much with because his father died during World War II. So he's raised by his Russian mother. And so he doesn't have anyone like him. So he identifies a lot with Pushkin. And you'll see um, there are a couple of other black writers when they go to the, to the Soviet Union, they think about Pushkin and they talk about his skin and, and would he be seen as black. But in terms of present day, 
Um, some of the most famous, we have Yelena Conga. She's an Afro-Russian journalist. Her mother is Lily Golden, who's in this picture with her. Um, and so they are very interesting because Lily Golden is the daughter of Oliver Golden, who is a Black agricultural specialist who went to Uzbekistan in the 30s. And he stayed and he married a, I believe she's a, a Polish Soviet citizen. And they had Lily and now their granddaughter is this famous Russian journalist and TV presenter. And her father was assassinated, but he was the first vice president of Zanzibar. So you have this really interesting connection with this anti-colonial movement from Africa, but also, you know, Black Russian royalty because of who her, fought, who her grandfather was kind of coming together. And Yelena Conga, she wrote a book um, called Soul to Soul. And it's a, it's a really interesting book because it kind of helps you see how she navigates her identity as a Black Jewish Russian and her, her black and Jewish culture is very important to her. And she recently did an interview with NPR and she, and she talks a lot about how strange it was for her when she was growing up, that she felt loved all the time because her mother is you know black, her mother is half black. But she talked about how when she went to the United States, she didn't really understand racism in the United States. She was dating a black man and they went to dinner together and they didn't, they kept getting sat like in the back of the restaurant. And her boyfriend at the time was very upset. And he said, no, we will sit in the front of this restaurant. Like, you know, we are equal here. We have the same color money. And she didn't understand it. She said they got into an argument later. She was like, why did you do that? Like, why can't we just sit in the back? And he was trying to explain to her like what it meant to sit in the back of the restaurant. And she didn't understand because she had never had that experience growing up in the Soviet Union. And so it's really interesting. And I think that when we look at the Afro-Russian and Afro-Ukrainian experience, it really speaks to the diversity of Black experience, but also how unique their situation is. Um, another recently well-known um, member of the Afro-Russian community, Maria Tonkara, she is a, a young um, like Gen Zer in St. Petersburg. She's really an influencer on social media, but she's been targeted a lot recently by hate groups and by far-right groups in Russia. Um, she posted screenshots on Instagram because about racism in Russia because people were saying that Russia isn't racist. It shows she took screenshots of people calling her an ape and people telling her there's no place for Negroes in Russia, even though she's Afro-Russian. Um, and she was actually recently investigated by the like special counsel in St. Petersburg for extremism, for talking about her experiences of racism in, in Russia. And I did put a picture of her on, on my PowerPoint because I, I do want her to preserve some type of privacy. Um, and on Alina Polyansky, she's also a TV presenter. She recently wrote a blog post about racism. And she said, you know, there is racism in Russia and in the United States. So what makes Russia different is that Russia won't admit that it has issues of racism, right? And so, you also have Afro-Ukrainians. Um, Gitana is probably one of the most famous uh, because she you know, led Ukraine to, I think, the finals in the 2012 Eurovision. And there was such a racist response to her representing Ukraine, even though she's half Ukrainian. And her music is very influenced by her Ukrainian heritage that people were saying she shouldn't represent Ukraine. Um, a member of the government said that if she represents Ukraine, people think they're just Africans in Ukraine. These really terrible things about you know this amazing singer and and um, songwriter, and so looking at the current experience of, of black people, because we do still have African students in Ukraine and in Russia, we have African people who live in Russia now and in Ukraine. We have Afro Russians and Afro Ukrainians. Some of the things they all talk about are is the violence and the threat of violence um, with skinhead gangs attacking people on subways, I think since 2020, 2010, there have been over 177 attacks on black people in, in Russia. Um, all of them mentioned the slurs, being called racial slurs, uh, being called apes, and staring, the constant staring, which I experienced when I was in Ukraine, where people kind of constantly stared at you at all times. They also mentioned the difficulty in finding jobs and apartments. And so what's interesting now is Although there are claims that there isn't any type of institutional racism in Russia or in Ukraine because race is not an official category, if a person cannot get a job or if a person cannot get housing because of their skin color, we're getting into issues of institutional racism. Um, a few of the, the stories I've read online talk about 
not putting down your race or lying about your race so you can get an apartment uh, because they won't rent to you. Or they'll, the landlord will say, I would rent to you, but the neighbors will all leave. They won't, they'll move out if I let you have an apartment. Um, another interesting aspect that I've seen is solidarity with Central Asians, because Central Asians have been targeted by, by citizens, by the police, by the special forces. Um, there have been hundreds of attacks on, on people from Central Asia. And so something I found interesting was how a lot of the Afro-Russians and, and Africans who are living in Russia and Ukraine speak about having solidarity with them and, and, and feeling bad for them. Um, and something that's really heartbreaking is when you look at the, the backgrounds of Afro-Russian and Afro-Ukrainian children, often their fathers are absent. And it isn't because their father said just up and leave, visas expire um, you, and you can't get a visa, a longer visa to stay, having to move back to Africa to very, for various reasons. So what happens is you often have mixed race children who are being raised in white Slavic families. And so this leads to issues of not being understood, of shame. Um, some people mention their grandparents not wanting to see them. Or one guy, his mother, took him to school, she was registering him for school, and they had a parent, you know, community meeting with all the parents, and none of the parents wanted him to go to that school. And his mother remembers them saying, well, you decided to have it, talking about him, this, you know, mixed race child. And so some of them talk about, and it's the same sentence I'll see multiple times, asking themselves when they're growing up, why am I black? Why is this happening to me? And just the idea that there are children who are growing up in Russia and Ukraine who feel that being Black is an affliction is something that's heartbreaking. And as, if you grow up around kids, kids can be incredibly cruel. And you will see some of the stories of, of these kids being made fun of, not having friends, being bullied, and the parents and teachers supporting this type of bullying. Um, and uh, the last thing that you see a lot is them wanting to leave. And I remember when I was in Ukraine and I saw this after Ukrainian girl and I was like, what are you doing here? And we were talking, she said, I, I, I live here, I'm Ukrainian, where else can I go? And that's also something that makes their experience so interesting and for us to study in terms of the black experience in, in Europe, Western Europe, you know, across, across the globe, they can't leave. How do you survive in a country where you don't feel safe, but that is your home country? Um, some of them talk about just staying when they live in Moscow, they stay as close to the center as possible. These are native Russian speakers who grew up in Russia who are Afro-Russian who do not feel safe in the outskirts of Moscow. And so that, that presents a problem that we've been talking about in the field with sending students of color to Russia, to Ukraine to do research because we do have to face, you know, possible, you know, emotional and physical violence against ourselves because of our skin color. Um, and, and something I've noticed, I've noticed more that I've been doing this research in terms of racism towards people of color, 2018, when, when Russia held the World Cup, you started seeing more comments of forgotten children. And they've been kind of treating Afro-Russian children in particular as like an aberration. And in 2018, um, Tamara Pletnova, who was head of the Committee on Children then, she warned Russian women because African, you know, soccer players are going to be coming to Russia. She said, we must give birth to our own. It's okay if they're of the same race, but if they're of another race, then that's something entirely different. Be their friend, but don't have kids with them. And people were asking her why, why she said this. She said, because they're going to be children and their father's not going to be here. And so you kind of have this fear of race mixing. And they brought in the Olympics and they brought in the 1957 Youth Festival as these, you know, examples of what happens when you mix races, you end up being a single mom, right? Ignoring the greater cultural and social problems that lead to these fathers either le leaving, some of them are killed. Um, and so they kind of gloss over that to focus on when you have race mixing, it always leads to social problems in Russia. Um, finally, and the last thing that's been most recent was the Yandex taxi driver issue. Uh, so it, over the summer, you had the growth of this Russian Lives Matter movement that I've, I've written about that is not in, in cahoots with the Black Lives Matter movement. It's just the opposite. And in, in I want to say, Bryansk, there's an African student 
who was denied a taxi ride and he was recording it and he's asking the taxi driver, why won't you give me a ride? And he says, are you racist? And the taxi driver says, yeah, I'm racist. And there was this huge blow up on, you know, the Russian social media networks supporting the taxi driver and saying he shouldn't have to give any Africans a ride if he doesn't feel safe. And so the student, he's later interviewed on the BBC, on the BBC Russia service, and he says, this is something I experience all the time. I finally just recorded it. And what struck me is that these are the same stories we see in New York with African-American men not being able to get rides in taxis, right? And so what I'm interested in is how do we go from the 20s and 30s where the Soviet Union can present itself as this anti-racist, you know, utopia. And it, it is a much better place for these African-Americans who visit in the 20s and 30s to in the 60s where we have African students, they're being harassed and one is killed to now where we have, you know, le very legitimate fears of being killed, of being harassed by different types of white supremacist groups, by just plain Russian citizens, Ukrainian citizens, and there isn't that safety there. Although Russia and Ukraine are two of the most diverse places in the region in terms of the number of ethnic minorities and the languages spoken. And that's kind of what I want to get into with my research. I think we have a huge um, amount of work to do. And I think that we can see from these experiences the impact of Soviet understandings of nationality and race and how they still shape the experiences of Afro-Russians and Afro-Ukrainians today. We can see the isolated nature of being a person of color in these countries. And for me and for my work, we can see how race informs ideas of national belonging. So when Afro-Russians and Afro-Ukrainians, when they're asked, what part of Africa are you from? Or when they're told like Gaikana that you can't represent this country, it means that a person of color cannot be part of the Ukrainian or Russian nation. And that, has major implications. Um, so before I finish, I do want to say that my work is very much grounded in the work of others. Um, and so Sean Guillory's work is highly influential. Maxim Matusevich, he does a lot of work on, on African students. Meredith Wilson, Jen, uh, Meredith Rahman, Jennifer Wilson, Allison Blakely, who wrote Russia and the Negro, which is a definitive text really for, for black, um, the Black experience in Russia such an imperial period, Woodford McClellan, um, all of these people have kind of produced work that has influenced my work. Um, and so hopefully you've learned a little bit about the Black experience in Soviet Russia and Ukraine and in the post-Soviet space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, I think now those of you in the audience have an opportunity to, to ask any questions that you might have. Um, and I already see, uh, here we go. This is a longer one. Um, there are quite a few questions. Um, and, and, you know, maybe Kim, do you want to read it? And, and, or do you want me to read it out loud? I'm like reading on the sides. Um, yeah, let me just say, I'll, I'll start the first question, which is, does your research investigate the possibility that the Black visitors in the USSR could be overprotected by the government as to try to exhibit the greatness of the Soviet Union to the rest of the world? Um, I think, and this is something I've been thinking about in terms of, yes, of course they're going to protect these travelers. I mean, it's, it's Langston Hughes, because he can come back and write a piece Instead of, you know, this piece that talks about how much his, ex his experience in the Soviet Union was great, he can come back and write, like, these Soviets are just as bad as these Southern races, right? And so I think that does play a role in it. But also, perhaps it's just my inner Soviet historian who's like, maybe in the 20s and 30s, it was just better. But also, they're comparing the Soviet Union to the Jim Crow South. I mean, the bars really low. Right, um, but also they were they didn't have a lot of freedom of movement. There's actually a, there was an African community in Abkhazia in the Caucasus that they wanted to go visit, and they weren't allowed to go visit them. Also, they're there during, and I also work on the on Ukrainian history during the Holodomor. So Ukraine, the Don regions are starving to death at the same time they're in Moscow. 
So they, they didn't really get to see the, the full Soviet Union, but what they did see for a lot of them was fundamentally different and it, it shaped their identities in a big way. Um, and then another follow-up question. Um, can we understand that the Soviet people and government did not see at the time black visitors as economic and social menaces to the mainstream as in general, they could be seen only as temporary tourists, student or workers? Definitely. Um, I think that is something that's important to understanding how they're treated. They're going to go home. Right, so we, we can show off the Soviet Union is really good, but also the specialists that they recruit, these, and this is something that's so important, like black ag agricultural specialists helped the Soviet Union become you know, an agricultural exporter. They helped us, you know, they helped the Soviet Union build factories, but they then went home. And so when I look at how African students were treated and a lot of African students, they didn't want to stay in the Soviet Union. They wanted to go back home where they're part of the majority, where they have opportunities. But African-Americans didn't have that. But now, with the treatment of Africans, but also Central Asians, there is very much an economic aspect there. This economic insecurity where you're here to take our jobs, but also this fear of race mixing. And I think it also speaks to like the insecurity of the nation. We don't want you impregnating our women. So you see that in the 60s, you see that from the 60s onward, when that wasn't really as much as a claim in the 20s and 30s, although it did happen. Yelena Conga is an example of that. Um, and then uh, I think there's a couple more questions. Um, how can we understand the relationship between this apparent non-racist character of the USSR and the blatant ethnophobia directed toward people in other Soviet countries? And then there's one more question that this individual had that I'll, I'll just throw out there too. And then can you tell us a little bit about your present experience in Russia and Ukraine, mainly about your impressions and the existence or not of racism in Russia today? Right. Um, I, and I think that is the ethnophobia and the xenophobia that happens. World War II really is a, a turning point. I got to 1947, it's illegal for Soviet citizens to even marry foreigners. So like Lloyd Patterson married a, a Russian uh, citizen and um, Oliver Golden married a Russian woman in Uzbekistan. That ends. And this, 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 this constant focus on, you know, capitalist encirclement you really start seeing that hitting home. But also, it, I, I think the issue, like they invite African students over and they invite students, you know, from Vietnam or from Cuba because they're trying to convince them to go towards the Soviet Union, not towards the United States. But I, I, and I do want to explore how is this connected to Soviet nationality policy as we have the hardening of national identity at this point. But also you have distrust against particular nationalities because of World War II, people perceived as, you know, national enemies. That that happens during World War II and that impacts how people see other nationalities. Um, and I think it's definitely worse since since the Soviet Union fell because now it's it gets not illegal to be racist to somebody. Um, so my own experience, so um, I went to Ukraine in 2013 and I, I was in Kiev, I was in Odessa, and overall I, I did have a good experience, but I was also incredibly careful with what I did. I didn't go out at night alone. Um, I spoke Russian so I could get around. I mapped out my route. You know, I was very careful about where I went. Um, and, and I did run into some skinheads, and, but luckily like I was okay because I'm a woman. And also gender very much does play a role. And, and your safety and security in, in, in these countries. If I was a black man, my experience would be different. Terrell Stars talked a lot about that, um, about how his experience in Ukraine. Um, and Odessa, Odessa is just a different vibe from everywhere I've ever been in the world. Um, and Odessa, I was told when I was in Odessa, they kept telling me about this African part of the neighborhood. I never got to go, but I, I do want to go because apparently there are a lot of African people who live in Odessa. Um, but I, ha I mean, I have been harassed by people online from Russia. There was a hit piece written about me um, in connection to the Russian Lives Matter. Um, so I've been trolled by, you know, people who do that. But I think something that's important for people to understand is when African Americans or Africans or Afro Russians, Afro Ukrainians talk about racism in Russia or in Ukraine, it is not to say that they are less than Western countries. It is to talk about the fact that they are dealing with very Western problems. And talking about racism in a place does not mean that place isn't good. It means you want that place to be better. 
I love the region and that's why I want to talk about these issues. These places should be safe for people of color and right now they're not. Um, and I think in relation to some of the stuff that you were just saying about gender, we do have a question in the chat about sort of the intersections of race and gender and um, that you talked a bit about missing fathers um, or there were also missing mothers. So gender is really interesting and it hasn't been studied that much. And I think the bulk of my dissertation is going to look at black women. Um, but you, I haven't seen much about missing mothers. It's mo and it's the missing fathers, and of course it, it ties into these tropes about black dads not being around. But when you look at a lot of these cases, it's like my husband was a student and they didn't renew his visa and he had to go back, or he stayed here over his visa and he was captured and he had to go back. Um, in a few cases, like in Elena Conga, uh, she, I think she, no, Gaetana, Gaetana moved to Africa with her father, and her parents ended up divorcing, and her mother took her back to Ukraine. So it happens that sometimes they do go to Africa with their husbands or with their boyfriends and they end up coming back. But in terms of women, I want to explore this because you really see race mixing happening from a Soviet citizen who's a female and a black man versus the other. And I want to understand why that's happening. Are there half black children who have black mothers? Because um, Yelena Conga is special in that her mother is mixed race, but her mother is a descendant of one of these black travelers in the 30s. But gender really hasn't been addressed that much in the literature, and it's something I want to do. Um, and I, I want to say that many people have stated in the chat, I think very loudly, that this is a really important talk and that, you know, everyone really appreciated everything they shared um, and the, the work that you're doing. So, just sidebar. Uh, not really sidebar, but important. Um, so, okay, I'm just trying to keep up here. Um, do you think the idea of proletarization of peoples might be one of the reasons why there is not enough space for differences because we're all the same? Mm, I think, I feel like that could be an idea where initially national and ethnic difference wouldn't matter for all part of the proletariat. And this is also like, that's the test, right? It, it's easier to claim, you know, everyone's, we have this great multicultural paradise of workers when it's Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Russians versus when it's people from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Georgia, and Africa. And I think the experiences of people of color, not only African Americans and Africans, but also Central Asians, really speaks to the limits of Soviet like national celebration and acceptance. Um, and that's what I hope my work will do, will show is how these lived experiences should challenge our understandings of the efficacy of Soviet nationality policy and creating that acceptance. Um. And then here, uh, how much uh, do you think that the export of U.S. media has played a role on the shift in American Russian attitudes toward Black people? Absolutely. I just wrote a piece about this. And I will say from my own experience, I was in Bulgaria in 2011, and a group of children, there were Roma children, I was working at an orphanage, they got around me in a circle and they started calling me racial slurs. And I remember I just cried. And it wasn't, and it, I was upset that I was hurt because I fundamentally did not understand, like, how could these Roma orphan children know these racial slurs, right, in the middle of nowhere in Bulgaria? And that's when I kind of started thinking about the importance of American racism and how it's being exported, right? Like, and, and when I, and I wrote my piece about Brat 2 and how Brat 2 kind of uses these same anti-Black tropes we see in American Hollywood films about black people. And I think that's why the American media portrayal of it's like right now, the Black Lives Matter protests and, and these things, I think it's very dangerous for people of color in Russia. Because if you haven't had any experience of people of color, the only media you're observing is us as thugs and robbers. That very much could mean that when you have an, a, a situation where a, a skinhead is you know, harming someone, you may not help them. And I, I've written about this because I, I have seen American racial language towards the Black Lives Matter movement showing up in both 
pro-Putin and anti-Putin media in Russia. There was um, a, a, a protest in Ternopil by African students. So Ternopil, Ukraine, there was a protest of African students there about the racism that they were experiencing. And the, I think the city council member in Ternopil said, well, we should just deport them, get their names and kick them out. I mean, we literally see the same thing in America. If you don't like it, you leave, right? Afro-Russians, Afro-Ukrainians, African-Americans, we don't have the luxury of leaving the places we were born in, right? Um, and I think, you know, this is, was a question that came up for a number of people. So I think, you, you know, you've addressed it. So let me skip down. Um, and again, I think more people are engaging in this and talking about, you know, having, you know, experiences in Russia um, and hearing people there talk about, you know, how their understanding of race was influenced um, by U.S. television. Um, another question here is, thank you for sharing your research. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how the American racial paradigm is used to, to describe the experiences of Afro-Russians or Afro-Ukrainians by Afro-Russians and Afro-Ukrainians themselves, perhaps due to a lack of language around race from within Russia or Ukraine. That's a good question. Um, so when I was in Ukraine, when I, and I would talk and I met two Black people in Ukraine, one of them was from France. So I was like, are you Ukrainian? She said, no, I'm French. But this other one, she said, I'm Ukrainian. So she didn't identify herself as African. She said, I'm Ukrainian, but she was Black. Um, and I was part of a panel on Tuesday with an Afro-Ukrainian, um, Tia Darina, and she was talking about why they use the language of African. She says, I'm African-Ukrainian. And so it's the identity. She said, I'm both. And I don't want to have to choose between one or the other. And um, there's a great book that came out last year called Afropean. And it's written by Johnny Pitts. He's a, um, like a Black British journalist. And he talks about what he calls the liminal space that mixed race Europeans kind of occupy having to sometimes choose identities, but what does it mean to be black European? Can you be both? Um, so when I speak of Afro-Russians and Afro-Ukrainians, I'm meaning people who are of you know, Russian heritage who grew up in Russia or Ukraine who have a Russian or Ukrainian parent and an, a parent of African lineage, but not all of them identify that way. Many of them say I'm Russian which is also interesting. So when someone says, are you black? They say, no, I'm Russian. Because that has some undercurrents too in terms of identity. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have another question, which is, um, you spoke about the, Russia, the racial undercurrents in Slavic among Slavic populations. Have you found such evidence among the Central Asian peoples under the USSR? I mean, in general, um, I will add my follow-up to that. Um, is, I mean, can you talk? I haven't heard race talked about as much in Central Asia in the context of like, you know, it's just not, it's not discussed as much, and I was just wondering if you could <laughs> talk broadly about everything in the world right now. <laughs> if you could well, say anything. So interesting, right? And I want to go to Central Asia. Like, I just want to kind of live in Central Asia. I want to go to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Because, one, when I'm reading about, like, Langston Hughes talking about his experiences there, but also, so Dorothy West, um, a couple of the women who went over in the 20s and 30s, they got to explore Central Asia. And they loved it. And I, I want I want to understand it because I, you don't see race talked about that much in the context of Central Asia. What you do see is the racialization of Central Asians when they migrate to, you know, Moscow or Petersburg. And Jeff Sahadeo has a great book about the racialization of Central Asians. But something I found interesting, they called Central Asians chorni, which was a slur to be called black in Russian. They saved that for Central Asians in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And they called Black students negro, meaning negro, which was accepted at that time. They would never call them chorni. And now they're using chorni, the slur, for Blacks and Central Asians. And I found that fascinating, right? Like, why did this change happen? But also they still, they call people the N-word. I was called that when I was there. Right, and so I think it's still that influence of American racism, but I'm fascinated by how racism has changed the use of language. But Central Asians, they, they have a special place in my heart because I, I wanna live there, but so many of these Afro-Russians and Afro-Ukrainians 
they claim solidarity with Central Asians, and the, some of them say, like, they're treated so badly, and, you know, they, they worry about them, and when one of them was asked why Russia doesn't have, like, a Black Lives Matter movement, she said, the Central Asians should have one first. And she said, they need to have one first and we'll support them and we can support each other. Um, and, and it's just sad how many populations are being oppressed, but that really struck me that the, they're very aware of how unequal Central Asian residents are treated. Um, so, I mean, I think we're probably, we're just getting, it's 5.04. Um, so I think, you know, I think we probably have to part ways now, but I, you know, I see again, more and more um, appreciations of all the, everything that you're, you know, you're saying that it's just so interesting and um, thank you so much. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll be here in a couple of weeks again with another talk um, and, and approaching different aspects of race in Russia. And um, thank you so much, Kim. I'm sorry, that's my... Well, but thanks. thank you so much. And um, thank you so much everyone for being here. Thank you. I, I'm glad I was able to do this. Thank you all so much for spending more Zoom hours <laughs> with me. Um, and I see there are a lot of questions. So like if, if you guys want to email um, Kansas and you know, see if I can answer them, I, I will happily do that too. Bye everyone.